There is no proof, but if legend is correct, the killing at the infamous St. Valentine's Day Massacre was planned by machine gun Jack McGurn, a.k.a. Vincenzo Gibaldi. He adopted the name Jack McGurn when he was a prize fighter because the general belief was that an Irish boxer would put up a bloody fight, meaning more seats were sold in the auditorium. Someone from the Capone Organization Someone whose voice boss George Bugs Moran, 1893-1957, would not recognize, placed a call to the Irishman, posing as an independent hijacker with a load of old log cabin whiskey to sell at a below market price. The north side boss leaped at the offer. The caller said he would phone back when he had the shipment ready. Two weeks passed before the unknown Capone had called the north siders again. He said he had a shipment that he could deliver on February 14, 1929, Valentine's Day, at 11 a.m. Temperatures had dipped to zero that Thursday morning, February 14, 1929. The sky was gray and the streets were covered with a blanket of snow and ice, causing a bad morning rush hour, worse than usual. More snow was predicted for the end of the day. That morning, Al Capone was in Florida at his beachfront mansion. In Chicago, the first to arrive at the brick, one-story warehouse of the SMC Cartage Company garage at 2122 North Clark Street was John May, who unlocked the front doors at about 8.30 a.m. It should be noted that the garage wasn't the Moran Gang's headquarters, it was simply a storage facility for the gang's booze. May wanted to get an early start on a flatbed that the gang used to transport beer barrels, the truck needed a new oil pan. He brought with him his beloved Alastation named Highball, who was leashed to the truck's bumper. May, at 35, 1894 to 1929, was the least dangerous of the group. A $50 a week mechanic, May had joined up with the Morans after a failed career as a safecracker. His one arrest, in 1913, for larceny, was stricken from the records. The son of Irish immigrant parents, and the father of seven children, he had promised his wife, Hattie, he would stay out of trouble and the day he left for the garage, he carried a case with a saint's medal in his back pocket. He was working on a truck that morning, while six other men arrived. The always miserable Gusenberg brothers, born as Gusenberger, arrived at about 9.30 they were the toughest members of the gang. Frank Gusenberg aka Hawk, was married to Lucille Gusenberg and Ruth Gusenberg at the same time. Unknown to them, the son of a German immigrant, Frank's first arrest came in 1911, under the name Bloom, for disorderly conduct, although from 1909 to 1914, he was held as a suspect in numerous robberies and burglaries. In 1911, he served 90 days in the Bridewell prison for disorderly conduct. In 1924, he was tried but found not guilty of burglary. Another robbery charge in 1926 was dismissed. Peter Gussenberg, 1889-1929, aka Goosey, never explained to his wife Myrtle Koppelman that he was a gangster. Instead, she was convinced that he was a salesman whose last name was Gorman. Peter Gussenberg appeared on police blotters in 1902 for larceny, did three years at Joliet Prison for burglary in 1906 until 1909, but was returned there in 1911 on a parole violation. In 1923, he was sentenced, with Big Tim Murphy, to three years in Leavenworth on a mail robbery charge. Primarily, the Gusenbergs were enforcers for Moran. James Clark, 1887 to 1929, and Adam Heyer, followed the Gusenbergs into the garage. Clark, Albert Kachalek, was 42 years old, the son of German immigrant parents. His record started in 1905 for competence games. He was arrested for robbery in 1910, followed by a term in Pontiac Reformatory for burglary. The state's attorney struck two charges of robbery and one of murder from the records in 1914. Since he was constantly in trouble, he changed his name to James Clark for his mother's sake. Clark was primarily an enforcer. Adam Heyer, age 40, a.k.a. Adam Hayes, a.k.a. John Snyder, a.k.a. Frank Snyder, was the Moran's business manager and accountant. The warehouse was leased in his name. He had been married for only seven months to his wife Mame. Heyer's record went back to 1908 for armed robbery, 
for which he served a year in the Bridewell Prison. In 1915, he was sent to Joliet Prison for running a confidence game. Released a year later, he was locked up again on a parole violation in 1923. Albert Weinschenk, Weinschenker, 1903-1929, arrived last. The son of a Russian immigrant father, Weinschenk, was part of Moran's cleaners and Dyer's racket. The idea behind the dry cleaners racket was to form all of Chicago dry cleaners under one protection association, meaning the dry cleaners would all pay Moran the same monthly amount. But the larger idea was to have ready access to the chemicals that made quick drying cleaning possible and synthesize them into an inexpensive dope. Otherwise, he owned a speakeasy, the Alcazar. From a distance, he bore a resemblance to Moran and the Capone lookouts may have mistaken him for Moran on the day of the massacre. The last to enter the garage was probably Dr. Reinhard Schwimmer, age 29. 1900-1929. The son of German immigrants, he was trained as an optometrist. Not a gangster himself, Schwimmer was thrilled to be in the company of real gangsters. He had been around the gang since the days when Obanyan was boss. Schwimmer only styled himself a doctor and he had little or no medical training. His practice was at 625 North Avenue although he was rarely there. Schwimmer was an inveterate gambler. Running up large debts, and he spent more time at the racetrack than at his work, causing his practice to founder. He was married, for less than a year, to a woman named Faye Johnson. Just days before he was married, in 1923, he was so deeply in debt that he was asked to leave the luxurious Parkway apartments where he lived. But his new wife was rich, and she paid the tab with the understanding that he would stop gambling and hanging around with gangsters, whom he emulated to the point of dressing like one of them. By 10.30 a.m., there were seven men gathered in the garage. As May worked on the truck, the others drank coffee and warmed themselves near a small iron space heater in the corner. After Weinshank, the man who resembled Moran, entered the garage, two of Capone's lookouts who were stationed across the street on the third floor of a Mrs. Duty's boarding house, 2119 North Clark, still standing, picked up the phone and, probably, called the Circus Cafe, where the killers were waiting in a rented garage at 1722 Northwood, and told them that Moran had arrived. The killers climbed into a black, 1927 Cadillac, doctored to look like a police car. Two of the assassins were dressed as police officers. The other three wore long trench coats and fedoras. Tucked inside their coats were sawed-off shotguns and Thompson submachine guns. If Fred Killer Burke was there, and most experts assume that he was, he was probably driving the car, which pulled up outside the SMC Cartage Company a few minutes past 10.30. At the Parkway Hotel, several blocks away from the garage, George Bugs Moran kissed his wife Alice goodbye and took the elevator down to the lobby where he met his bodyguard, Ted Newberry, who was waiting for him. Moran was late getting up that morning. It was already 10.30. As he and Newberry were rounding the corner from an alley, they spotted the police wagon as it rolled up to the front of the garage. Figuring the police were there for just a routine bust, Moran and Newberry took a left from the alley they were walking on to Clark Street from and had a coffee until the raid was over. At about that same moment, another Moran enforcer, Willie Marks, was approaching the garage from a different angle, spotted the police, and also veered off the path. After a reenactment of the crime, authorities concluded that the two men dressed as policemen entered the garage and acted as if they were officers on a routine investigation. They disarmed the Morans and forced them up against the wall. As soon as their backs were turned, the three men in plain clothes entered with rifles and machine guns and shot them down. A bullet struck the small metal case that mechanic John May was carrying in his back pocket. Half of May's face was obliterated by a close-up shotgun blast. Witnesses saw the two uniformed policemen exit the garage while escorting the plain cloaked men who held their hands up in the air, as if they were under arrest. May's dog was barking and howling, and when neighbors went to check and see what was going on, they discovered the murder scene. When the police arrived, they found Frank Desenberg alive, breathing heavily and choking on his own blood. 
When he was asked for the identity of the killers, he shook his head, no and breathed, I'm not going to talk, before he laid his head back and died. Another school of thought says that he actually said nobody shot me, still a third notion is that he didn't know who the killers were and said as much. The dead carried just over $5,000 in their wallets, about $82,000 in today's value. When a rumor spread that it was actually Chicago policemen, and not gangsters dressed as policemen, who did the killing, a forensic scientist from New York, Calvin Goddard, was called in to test all the machine guns in the police force's possession to rule out the possibility. Goddard could not match up any weapon in the police arsenal to the bullets found at the scene. Some think that two of the killers, the two dressed as policemen, were Capone thugs John Scalise and Albert Anselmi, who had been used in several other murders. Other suspects in the murders that day included Louis Campagna, 1900-1955, Claude Screwy Maddox, a member of the circus gang, Joey Lalordo, younger brother of the murdered Pasqualino, Tony Accardo, Sam Giancana, Machine Gun McGurn, George Shotgun Ziegler, 1897-1934, Gus Winkler and Crane Neck Nugent, no one will ever know with exact certainty who the killers were. The only person closely identified was Fred Killer Burke, also known as Fred Dane. Machine guns found in his home were tested and compared to bullets removed from the dead gangsters and were perfect matches. A woman who noticed the killer's flee also described Burke. She identified Burke as the policeman who was wearing round sunglasses and missing a front tooth. Willie Marks, a Moran gunman, was lucky that day. He cheated fate, but fate caught up with him in the summer of 1933, when, acting as a bodyguard for Chicago's Teamster president Pat Burrell, he and Burrell were murdered by the mob as they fished in a Wisconsin lake. Several months later, the mob caught up with Teddy Newberry too. His sin was to take a stab at power in an ill-fated partnership with Chicago's mayor Anton Cermak. In the middle of the day, the boys yanked Newberry off of a north side street, pulled him into the back seat of a car, tied him in barbed wire, beat him savagely, burnt his face with cigarettes, and finally shot him through the head and dumped him in a roadside ditch in Indiana. By November of 1946, Bugs Moran had fallen on hard times and had turned to pulling off small-time robberies. By 1947, the bug was serving 20 to life behind bars for a bank robbery in Ansonia, Ohio. He died in a prison hospital of lung cancer in February of 1957. The Moran gang executioners didn't fare much better. A hustler named Jimmy Bozo Shoup, who provided the guns used in the massacre, was stabbed to death. Joe Ginta, John Scalise, and Albert Anselmi, all suspected gunmen in the massacre, were dead by 1934, all murdered by the mob. Al Capone beat Scalise and Anselmi to death with a baseball bat. The Purple Gang, who arranged the fake whiskey shipment to bring the gang to the garage, and may have provided the lookouts as well, were killed off before the close of the decade, mostly at their own hands. Right after the massacre, police raided the home of Fred the Killer Burke, a member of the Egan's Rats gang, where they found the Tommy guns used in the massacre. Burke fled Chicago to Michigan, where he shot and killed a patrolman named Charlie Skelly, after Skelly tried to stop Burke for his part in a hit-and-run accident. The Skelly murder outraged the state of Michigan, and when Burke was finally captured a year later, it refused to honor Chicago's request to extradite the killer to face trial for his role in the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Burke died in the Michigan State Prison and never talked about the Valentine's Day killings. However, according to a jailhouse snitch, Burke's playmates in the massacre included Smiling, Gus Winkler, and Murray Humphreys. In late 1933, Winkler was murdered outside of a beer plant, owned by Cook County Commissioner Charles Weber, at 1414 Roscoe Street. As Winkler strolled towards Weber's office, the killers leaped out of a green truck and fired low, into his waist. In all, 72 pellets and bullets went into Winkler in a matter of seconds. He was literally riddled with gunshot from his neck to his ankles. It was never clearly established why Winkler was killed or who killed him. It could have been anyone, for any one of a hundred reasons. By 1933, machine gun Jack McGurn, the number one suspect in the massacre, was broke and out of power. 
How Brooke McGurn was came through when newspaper reporters found him in a Midtown restaurant and asked him if he had anything to do with the kidnapping of Jake the Barber's son, Jerome Factor. Boys, McGurn said, I ain't made a payment on my house, the roof over my head, in 11 months, so's I guess I'm gonna lose the place to foreclosure. So if I snatched Jake's kid, believe you me, I would have collected the dough long before this. 72 pellets and bullets went into Winkler in a matter of seconds. He was literally riddled with gunshot from his neck to his ankles. It was never clearly established why Winkler was killed or who killed him. It could have been anyone, for any one of a hundred reasons. Three years later, Jack McGurn went down to Florida and begged Willie Heaney, a pimp and drug addict under Capone, but a power in the labor extortion business, to set up a meeting between him, the mob's banker, Jake Guzak and Nitty. In the old days, Heaney would have told the world that one of Capone's top sluggers was interested in talking to him. Now it was different. At the age of 33 McGurn's world had fallen apart. The St. Valentine's Day murders had made him too hot for the syndicate to deal with. His gorgeous wife, Louise, the blonde alibi he had used to keep him from being convicted for his role in the massacre by testifying they were holed up in a love nest at the time of the shooting, left him years ago when his money ran out because of his gambling problem. Now McGurn was reduced to running numbers and selling junk, dope, in the black neighborhoods. But he wasn't much good at that either. McGurn was never an earner, a money hustler, he was an enforcer, a pretty boy killer, with a mean streak. But, with Capone gone and the beer wars over, McGurn was of no use to anyone anymore. And a lot of hatred towards him from inside the mob was personal. As McGurn went down the sewers, the hoods that had been on the lower end of the chain, like Heaney, were rising up and they delighted in abusing the once arrogant McGurn, now that Capone wasn't around to protect him. Now, in 1936, when the mob was on the brink of earning more money than it ever dreamed of, Machine Gun Jack McGurn had to beg for a five-minute appointment to see Heaney, Guzak, and Nitty. In the meeting, held on a golf course outside Miami, McGurn said that he needed a job inside Nitty's loan sharking operation. They turned him down. He was high profile and the stigma of the massacre never left him. In desperation, McGurn launched into a plan he had of running dope from the Caribbean into Chicago to flood the black neighborhoods. If the bosses would front the money, McGurn swore, his plan would make them all rich. That's how far down the ladder McGurn was. He didn't know Nitty was already working with Lucky Luciano to establish dope routes in California and Florida. McGurn was dismissed and told to return to Chicago. He was all done in the rackets as far as they were concerned. In 1936, the evening before St. Valentine's Day, machine gun Jack McGurn went bowling at a second-floor alley at 805 Milwaukee Avenue. Still standing, it has been a warehouse for many decades since the murder, three men walked in and stood behind his chair. One of them said, stick em up and stand where you are. Nobody knows who the three men were. Years later, Tony Accardo said he had been in the group, but as Accardo's power grew, and fewer and fewer people questioned his tales, Accardo had a tendency to put himself virtually everywhere in mob history including his claim that he was one of the gunmen at the massacre. While that doesn't seem likely, there is some evidence that Accardo and other members of his alma mater, the circus gang, did plan the massacre. One of the three killers whispered to McGurn this is for you, you son of a bitch and then aimed a pistol, carefully just below McGurn's right ear, and then fired a volley into McGurn. Then he fired another round into his lower neck. The men carefully stretched out McGurn's body on the alleyway and left a card on his chest that showed a man and woman without clothes on, staring at a sign that read house for sale. The card read, you lost your job. You lost your dough, your jewels and handsome houses. But things could be much worse, you know. Before the killers left, one of them turned and walked back to the table where McGurn had been sitting just a minute before, and took the tally sheet which had the names of McGurn's bowling partners on it, shoved it in his pocket and walked away into the night. The police found $3.85 in his pockets. There was no life insurance policy, 
but somehow the family managed to have him buried in a $1,000 copper coffin. His three younger brothers carried him to his grave, while McGurn's mother wailed, Why? Why did they kill my boy? He never did anything to anybody. Al Capone, jailed at Alcatraz, sent a dozen white roses. Sixteen days later, on March 2nd, perhaps remembering the family's tradition for vengeance, the mob hunted down McGurn's younger brother and former bodyguard, Anthony, to a local pool hall where he was playing cards and cut him to pieces with a rifle. Nobody will ever know who killed McGurn or why. The popular theory was that Bugs Moran had done the deed, but that doesn't seem likely. In June of 1958, Claude Maddox died in his sleep of natural causes. Maddox had been the boss of the old circus gang and had played a major role in planning the massacre by providing the guns, police car, and uniforms. Unlike everyone else connected to the murders, Maddox had played his cards right over the years and rose up in the syndicate, working under Jake Guzak for a while, and then for Murray Humphreys. He died a rich, powerful man. It was Maddox who burned and chopped up the car used to carry the killers to Moran's warehouse, and if the testimony of a hood named Byron Bolton is to be believed, Maddox was also one of the murderers at the massacre, although that seems doubtful. The FBI showed up to photograph Maddox's funeral and the burial. Tension was high and several hoods in attendance talked about shooting the agents until boss Tony Accardo's cooler head prevailed. The other primary killers in the massacre were the Purple Gang of Detroit. The gang's undisputed leader was Sammy Purple Cohen, who joined his gang with the Oakland Sugar House Gang under the direction of the Bernstein brothers, Abe, Ray, and Joe. Together, they were transformed from a small-time gang of troublesome teens to bootleggers and occasional muscle for other, larger bootleg gangs. Author Paul K. Vief, who has written extensively about the gang said the Purples were, for the most part, the sons of recently immigrated Russian Jews, although some of the members were actually born in the old country and brought here as infants, all of them were the sons of the working poor. The Purples were really a very loose confederation of mostly, but not exclusively, Jewish gangsters. Well, the gang started as a group of juvenile delinquents on the Lower East Side of Detroit, a group of about 16 or 17 children from the same neighborhood. Mostly, they were involved in the usual petty crime of juveniles, rolling drunks, and stealing from hucksters. It was the advent of Prohibition that really got them organized. Prohibition started in Michigan on May 1, 1918. Detroit was really the first U.S. city with a population of over 250,000 to have a prohibition law. The opportunities provided by that, early prohibition, are what helped to escalate these kids into mobsters. Remember, Detroit is a mile away from Windsor, Canada, and beer was easily available there from their export docks. Strangely, Ontario, where Windsor is, had a prohibition law, but not a law against exporting liquor to countries that didn't have prohibition, so just about anybody with a rowboat could go over there and tell the export people they were picking up a shipment that was to go to Cuba. Nobody asked a lot of questions. The money was fantastic. By 1923 the bootleg business in Detroit was estimated to be over $250 million a year, but the Purples weren't so much involved in bootlegging liquor as they were hijacking liquor and that was really how they made their reputation. They were a predatory group and they were known for their ruthlessness, I mean they would shoot everybody during these hijackings, even the guys who were simply driving the trucks. What that resulted in was that if you were making a beer delivery and were robbed by the Purples, you fought to the death, because you knew that the Purples were going to haul you out of the truck and kill you anyway. By 1925, the Purples had established themselves as strong-arm guys, bodyguards, and the like, for gamblers in Detroit. But what gave them life as a gang was that they had an enormous payroll, they had cops on their payroll, city officials, newspaper people, really they could not have operated the way they did without the official nod. As to the gang's name, KV Throat, there isn't a lot of available to clearly explain the origins of the name, but it was probably a journalistic adventure, because I found no reference to any operation called the Purple Gang until 1928. One story was that when they were kids and were stealing from shopkeepers, one of the shopkeepers said that those kids are off-colored, they're purple, purple like the color of bad meat. 
Another story is that there had been two brothers, Sam and Ben Purple, who had been associated with the gang when they were juveniles, but had nothing to do with the adult organized crime group. But I don't believe that has anything to do with it. Again, my best guess is that the name was a media invention. The core group of the gang was composed of the Bernstein brothers, Abe and Joe, who were the leaders of the gang. Abe was more or less the diplomat Joe was the mover and shaker on the street. He later became a legitimate businessman. The core was 10 or 12 guys who grew up on the Lower East Side of Detroit. Sometimes the gang numbered as high as 18 or slightly more. The Purples did sell drugs, actually I should say, what they did was to create a protection racket for the hoods who did sell drugs as a main source of income. So a dealer could operate in the city and make a lot of money selling drugs and so long as they kicked back to the Purple Gang, if they didn't kick back to the Purples, then the Purples brutally put them out of business. The same was true for the handbook industry. Once there was one handbook operator who refused to pay the purple so they took him and brought him out to the lake, cut a hole in it and dunked him in the ice a couple of times, after that, he paid. The so-called Little Jewish Navy was a fraction of the purple gang and was led by a guy named One-Armed Jell Finn. Jell Finn and several others in the group were Chicago gangsters who were thrown out of Chicago by the Capone mob, were the core of the group. Again, there were about 10 or 12 members in all. They were bankrolled in this venture by the Purples. The group also did enforcement work for the Purples too. Otherwise, they had about a dozen fast boats and they hauled liquor from Canada into Detroit. They came to prominence as labor muscle field during the Cleaners and Dyers War, where the Purples and several Chicago hoods organized the Detroit Cleaners and Dyers by creating trade associations that they controlled and then extorted hundreds of thousands of dollars a year out of the industry which was a lot of money in those days. The Purple's brutality in this is what helped them to make their mark in the underworld. What distinguished the Purple Gang from other gangs of the same size was their ready and willingness to kill. The gang, which never numbered more than 51 members, excelled in extortion, shipment protection, trafficking of narcotics, bootleg liquor, gambling, and the occasional hijacking of unprotected liquor shipments. In the mid-1920s, the Chicago mob under Al Capone made contacts with the gang. The Capone organization put the Purples in contact with their other satellite gang, Egan's Rats out of St. Louis. There was so much liquor coming through Detroit, Kavif said that Al Capone decided he was going to set up a base of operation here. Well, in 1927, he came here and had a meeting with the Purples and the Italian mobs and told them what his idea was. Well, they told him, basically, that river belongs to us and that he wasn't moving in here. And Capone, who was an astute businessman, realized that instead of going to war with the Purples, it would just be easier set them up as his agents in Detroit. So the Purples put a label on Canadian club whiskey and called it Old Log Cabin, a good quality liquor that they were selling to the Capones. One of the people that Capone sold Old Log Cabin to was Bugs Moran. Bug Moran decided that he wasn't making enough money off his liquor sales and decided to buy from some hijackers who had an inferior product which Moran was actually selling at a high profit, but his distributors started complaining about the quality and when Moran called Capone and said that he wanted to start selling Old Log Cabin again, Capone said that he was sorry, that he had already sold Moran's consignment to somebody else. So Moran started hijacking the Purple Gang supplied trucks which probably brought the Purples in on the murder as conspirators. Three of the Purples rented rooms across the street from Moran's warehouse in fact and Abe Bernstein, acting as an anonymous hijacker, set up a deal with Moran to sell Moran a load of hijacked Purple Gang liquor that he was willing to sell for a very low price and Moran agreed to meet him at his now famous garage. The role of the Purples were the spotters, they watched the Morans enter the garage and then tipped off a group of hitmen from a gang called Egan's Rats. That was why Moran lived, the Purples mistook Al Weenshank as Moran. The gang became so well known for kidnapping that they were, for a short time, prime suspects in the disappearance of the Lindbergh baby. Their nationwide reputation eventually did them in. Although the gang remained a force in the underworld of prohibition, 
they started to fall apart in the early 1930s. The 1931 butchering of gangsters Hemi Paul, Izzy Sucker, and Joe Leibovitz at 1740, Collingwood Avenue on September 16, 1931, and the convictions that followed signaled the end of the Purple Gang forever. The remaining members of the gang were eventually murdered or chased out of the underworld by the new mobs, and by 1935, the Purple Gang was no more. The scene of the crime, Moran's Warehouse, has its own dreary history as well. In 1936, the S.M.C. Cartage Company, the site of the St. Valentine's Day murders, was an empty warehouse. No one wanted to buy it. That changed in 1945, when the Werner family turned it into an antique shop and were besieged by mail and visitors, crime buffs, from all over the world. The property was demolished in 1967, but a businessman named George Patey purchased the bricks from the infamous wall and reconstructed them inside a bar room in Vancouver, Canada. In 1997, the bricks were packaged individually and are now for sale over the internet. Today, the murder site is a small, pleasant park for senior citizens, nothing else remains of it. It